See, that's the difference between Hunter and me. I'll be like, yo, I've played Undertale, I've played Bug Snacks, I've played all these normie indie games. And Hunter's like, yo, guys, have you played Gargle Blingle, the Metroidvania that just came out last week? I've heard three people have played it, and it's pretty good. <laughs> Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the HGO Podcast. I'm one of your hosts today, Ethan, and joining me, as always, are my good friends, Hunter and Kyle. Hey, guys. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing just swell. You know, just another week of starting the recording right, right on time. Exactly. When definitely right when we said we're going to start it. I also realized I was like, I did the intro ever so slightly different. Like, I enunciated the HGO slightly different, and it threw me off. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can't do it. Can't do it. I'm too used to being stuck in our old fashioned ways. It's crazy. I also just like, I wonder, I wonder if you were to clip together every single intro, does it always sound the same? Like, do I, should I just get a pre recording of it at this point? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody say, save me a couple of breaths. Maybe we could, we could finish early then. Think about that, Kyle. We'd finish on time then. Say An AI seconds. generation of, of the intro. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, I, I'd be scared if you like. Yeah, imagine an AI version of the podcast. Would you get more content out of that? <laughs> Who knows? I would. Um, I don't know, but also, I don't think anyone should try to imitate me, much less an AI. <laughs> oh yeah, I'd be pretty scared to be honest. Yeah. Um, like when people talk about AI not being able to match the personality of someone's voice, that would definitely apply to Hunter. An <laughs> AI could not get his mannerisms down. 100 percent 100 percent um but welcome back everybody to the return of no games on the hgo podcast because we have no games Ooh. uh no i don't know games. it no we've games. got stuff coming obviously we've got octopath traveler 2 march is now looking a little bit lighter than usual because we had star wars but star wars off oops i swore sorry susan oh susan's fired oh i swore again oh dear it's going terribly um <laughs> That's oh, a yeah. good clip. Now an That's NFT a good clip. clown is taking her place, isn't it? <laughs> can I swear now that Susan gone? Now, now that Susan's gone, can I swear? I might no, genuinely have to censor that here. one. I might genuinely bucks. have to censor that one. That's that's actually tragic. But now, so uh, I don't know what we're we doing today. Xenoblade 3 ZLC came out. We've both played it, yeah. uh, Kyle and I. Um, yeah. So we'll talk all about that. We're going to go and we're going to farm you Xenoblade fans for every drop of content that we can. So we're going to talk about the DLC a bit. Talk about our hopes and dreams for the final uh, chapter. Uh, what we want to see, what we don't want to see. Uh, all of that jazz. And then after we've had our little Xenoblade moment, as we can't tend to do every couple of months on this podcast, we'll uh, get into some games that me and Hunter have been playing. Uh, Hunter's played Vampire Survivors. He finished Immortality. I have played well i've started playing yakuza kiwami and then uh we'll do that paramour talk that we promised last week but we didn't have enough time for because apparently nintendo directs are too big to shove something in at the end uh, so there's plenty of stuff to talk about uh this week uh if you're new here uh and you're on podcast services make sure to give us a follow give us a good five star review if you don't mind we really do appreciate it, it helps us uh show up in feeds right show up and recommended that'd be really helpful and if you are on the youtube where you're looking at our stupid faces please hit that subscribe button uh, we really uh, would appreciate it uh, especially this year we're trying to do more stuff go bigger and better so any subs any likes any of that uh <laughs> random jargon that i've just said if you can do any of it that'd be great because like i say it helps a ton uh more than awesome. you think if you're on youtube go watch my dead space review oh that is also out uh and it's good, and you should go watch it. I was too scared to watch it, uh, so uh, if you have, uh, if you have, the first ten seconds like me, are just bone it. chilling. Yeah, <laughs> just couldn't handle it. Just couldn't handle it. Uh, so there's plenty of stuff on the YouTube. So go and hit subscribe if you're new. There, we'd really, really appreciate it. Really, thank you. Uh, anyway, let's just get straight into it. I'm not here to muck around mainly because we spent two hours mucking around before we started the recording. So let's just get straight into it. We don't have time. Uh, Xenoblade 3 has finally got its third piece of DLC. Um, did I know that the DLC came out in packs like it did this time in Xenoblade 2. Did the base game get any DLC when Torna released, Kyle? Or was the last drop beforehand? Did it get anything like Final Push when Torna came out? Or was everything out at that point? I'm tr I don't remember if 
Alma getting added to the game was with the Torna update or not. Mm -hmm. But I think they were put around the same time as each other. So it's it's safe to say, because they haven't done really anything. Like, I know they had some free DLC with um, 2, and they haven't really done that with 3. So yeah. I'm of the assumption I'm of I'm of the assumption that there might be something that gets added between now and the release of the expansion that is free is my hope. Um mm-hmm. but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Xenoblade, may, yeah. Xenoblade 3 has been really light on its post release content compared to how two was. But with two it was more so a lot of just like quality of life fixing that got added to the game, like uh custom difficulty, enemy aggression turn off. And then more blades got added in, stuff like that. Whereas Xenoblade Three was pretty, it was it was already a solid package on release, so it didn't. Yeah, it and maybe kind of feels just... like it didn't need that quality of life stuff that that Xenoblade Two did. It might also just be obviously Torna was bigger than they anticipated it being. Maybe mm-hmm. this time round because they knew they were going to do a big expansion that was basically another full game. They were like, okay, let's put all of our eggs in that one basket, which yeah. I don't blame them, to be honest, because um, I'd much rather they did make a whole new kind of expansion, a whole new game, than uh, add a couple of things here and there. But, you know, you never know. There might be some stuff still coming. But regardless yeah. of that, we did get uh, a few bits and pieces uh, to say goodbye to Xenoblade 3, I guess, if this is the last thing that we get. <laughs> um, what did we get, Kyle? Do you want to break it down for everybody? We got... So the whole thing or mm-hmm. like all the dlc waves are just this no just this one just wave. this one you know okay. what you got last just time last one. time you got the nop on hero uh, whatever her name is and uh, you got challenge mode and you got the kind of generic xenoblade challenge mode yeah like the usual stuff that you would expect from xenoblade what did you get this yeah. time the new this stuff. time around we got a new hero um yes masha her name That's is her name. i forgot her name i'm not gonna lie <laughs> I- I keep wanting to call her, like, Lapras or something. Well, she or is Lapis. the Lapper, whatever it is. She's but, like, yeah. yeah. but her title's, like, Lapterist Extraordinaire. She's, like, Lapterist Extraordinaire, Lapisist Extraordinaire. I don't remember. Yeah. I played it too so we got her. as well. <laughs> we yeah. got her. She's she's cool. I enjoy her play style. And we'll then we also it. got um this sort of, like, roguelike mm-hmm. challenge mode edition, which yeah. is a thing. We will talk about both of them. Uh, let's start with Masha. It's the more generic thing. And I think the thing to me is the weird thing about this is they keep adding these hero packs. And they obviously they added the Nopon uh, Blade for mm-hmm. the first challenge pack, which I've already forgotten her name. I don't remember her you name. Know. I'm sorry. That's it. And then they added, obviously, Masha this time around. And these do genuinely feel like, in a good and bad way, they definitely do feel like hero missions that were taken out of the base game and saved for an expansion um (laughs) which isn't necessarily bad but i also think that there's not much substance to them here especially masha's stuff because with eno i was like okay you've got all the cells that you need to upgrade her there's this whole separate upgrade tree similar to poppy with xenoblade 2 where it's like you've got something to do to make her better you've got all this stuff that you can do it felt like more of a package whereas this one genuinely did feel like two missions that were basically two fetch quests and then jobs is good and you're done goodbye xenoblade 3 and i was like this feels (laughs) extremely weird it feels out of place this one whereas eno felt like okay I can see why they kind of hold this one back a bit because there's stuff to do. This one, I genuinely was done with it in like an hour and I was like, you know what? In terms of hero missions, that most, nearly all the hero missions I really like in this game, but when I look back at all the hero missions that we had done, it's definitely one of the weakest uh, hero mm-hmm. missions in the game. And it's just like, especially because this character, Masha, she's not necessarily an unimportant character either. She is like, she is part of the city. Uh, spoilers for Xenoblade 3, by the way, if you haven't played the base game of Xenoblade 3. Uh, she's basically one of the leaders of the houses in the city. So she should have some sense of importance to her. And you think, oh, maybe there's a dynamic between her and Monica or between her and, you know, anybody in the city. There really isn't. It feels isolated. It very much feels like a side quest. And, you know, the biggest compliment we gave the game was the hero quests don't feel like side quests. They feel like main quests that they that are optional. They feel they feel like they have substance. This one, at least in my opinion, 
it did just kind of feel a bit fetch questy to be honest it was go to a hole pick this up go to another hole pick this up it was a bit mm -hmm. i don't know generic yeah, it, is that fair it to feels say? like it feels like there definitely could have been more to her quests especially because at the end of this at the end of her second quest it's revealed that she's basically the ambassador of rex's house yeah which you'd think that would be a much bigger deal but instead they just kind of gloss over it i mean also it's like i went back and looked at the law because i was like okay which house is this i went back and looked at the statues and i was like technically she's the leader of rex's quote-unquote house but rex was the kind of the person who started the house's <clears throat> kind of yeah hero, basically like their kind of idol their superior whatever you want to call it we don't know who actually started the house. king yeah king. we don't know who started the house but it is the one that's the descendants of kind of rex's kind of lineage but it's very mm -hmm. like i say it just kind of feels very nothing Empty. to me it just yeah it felt like it can it kind of felt like filler and i'm like here's the thing the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 expansion pass already has its value because you're getting a whole other game included in it. And all this other stuff is kind of, you know, extras in my mind. It's like, okay, cool, you know? <laughs> it's like the Incopolis in the Splatoon pack where it's like, you know, it's stuff that I don't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily have to care for because I'm going to get a big thing at the end of it, which I'm pretty happy yeah. about. But in comparison to Eno's hero stuff, that felt more substantive than what we got this time around. Um, which we'll talk about the challenge mode stuff, but I feel like if the first pack, it very much felt like, you know, you had Eno and all that stuff, and then the challenge stuff was just your generic challenge stuff. This time around, it feels like they went with, here's a generic quest, and the challenge stuff is the more interesting thing here. And it is the more interesting thing. I spent about five hours with this mode. So it's like... Oh, damn. Yeah. So it's like, I, it got pretty interesting, mainly because each run takes like an hour, but that's besides the yes. point. <laughs> ah, the returnal <laughs> approach. <laughs> but um, it did just kind of feel kind of eh. And I was like, this is a weird mm -hmm. place. Because it's like, is this it? Is this that? Is that it? Now, I've basically done all the story in Xenoblade 3, and that's what it's leaving with. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like if you're gonna if you haven't played Xenoblade 3 yet, you should just pick up the DLC pack on release because this isn't post game content. This is stuff that no. will feed in well or as a supplement as you're going on the endless journey. Yeah, uh, it's just an extra couple of stops to make, which feels right. And I feel like if you're playing it in the midst of the main game, I feel like it'll feel a lot better in its placement. Because mm -hmm. I remember like me. the Eno the Eno quest, like to just recruit her she's the first dlc blade or yep. dlc character not blade blah but um she like the enemies in that were like level 20 yeah you can do that like as soon as you get to that area yeah yeah but again it's, it's someone that doable. was a high level you could you know you got it but you start to go and collect all of the you know you had to go and collect all of the materials to upgrade her and stuff like that so there still felt like there was something there Mm -hmm. progression wise whereas this time it genuinely was a level 40 mission and a level 50 mission and i'm level 90 and if anyone knows my <laughs> opinion i'm not leveling myself down for shit dude i'm playing that as level 90 and going this is fun because i just want to see the cutscenes anyway i'm not here to go oh, i want a challenge but and don't get me wrong yeah. it's fine it's a fine yeah. bit of content but it's not <clears> like you're not looking you're not gonna look at it and go you know what that was a great piece of dlc it's like that's no, a great favorite piece of part content. of the whole package yeah no <laughs> and it's not gonna be uh unless the Peak story the expansion series. is really that bad um, <laughs> but it's it's interesting let's talk about the other challenge mode because i think i was very vocal when the first piece of dlc came out i'm not a huge fan of xenoblade's original challenge mode i don't care for it i think it's boring as sin i just it's just literally like oh look here's the thing you will tuck down to a level beat the fucker or die there you go have fun you'll get a, you'll get a couple of red stones if you do a good job and it's like okay here we go Woo. wonderful what's that there's costumes attached fuck i'm now gonna have to spend three hours doing this so that's what you do this time around um i don't know how would you describe it, it is kind of roguelike ish um, that's how they described it in the direct it's essentially hunter um you pick your you pick one person from your team uh with their class and their loadout and then it does what i was expecting the part of the main game to do and not just the ending ending where a load of the heroes show up 
But basically, as you're playing and you beat Wave, when you beat the Wave, a shop comes up and you can buy people. And you can buy heroes and you can buy stuff like that. So you can literally have all the hero, like, all, you can pick your favorite heroes that you want all on the stage at the same time, which I'm oh, like, I'm surprised yeah. they didn't do this at some point. And I know they have <laughs> the stupid thing where they all show up and go, hiya, we're here for two seconds in our anime ending to fight God. But I mean, I'm surprised there wasn't an actual part of this game where it was like, oh, people are separated and you've got a couple of extra heroes. So you can actually really make final dungeon yeah. better yeah that you can make comps based on all the heroes that you have and it's very interesting to me mm -hmm. anyway yeah um there's basically three difficulties there's like baby mode normal mode and hard mode and i think it's interesting because they've got they've got easy normal and hard difficulties and then easy normal and hard as the challenges in the thing as well so it's like yes. there's, there's, it's very weird how they do that and then the costumes i think it, it's sad but the costumes are basically a popularity contest where it's like the easiest difficulty you get the lands and center costumes the medium difficulty <laughs> you get the uni and tie on characters and then if you do the hard one you get the ones that people want which are the no romeo ones so dude i'm sad that the costumes were only from the last two xenoblade games and not throughout the whole series but yeah i think that's it's just i also think it was sad. very i also think it's really interesting the characters that they chose yeah to represent they're very weird so for Why example is tie on Jin. yeah so that tie on Jin. Weird. Uh, Noah is Shulk, which makes sense. Mio is Nia, which also makes sense. But also, Nia's in the game, so you could have given her literally any other character, and that would have been cool as well. Thank you. Yeah. She has, she does have a red ult for her skin, which in my head, I'm like, I don't know. Maybe they were just thinking, I'll just fucking chuck pyro colors on her. I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, looked, to be it honest. It looked cool. It looked like Mobius colors. I bought that one. It was pretty cool. Um <laughs> I also bought Noah's because I tried four times to beat this fucking hard one and I could not get to 50, so I just bought the ult and went, fuck you, I don't like Shulk anyway, I'll wear the white one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, That's the spirit. Uh, Unis is based yeah. on Melia, which I really like that one. That's probably one of my favorites in terms of the way that yeah, it's a really the cool one. Uh, yeah, you like said, Tyon is Jim. Lance <laughs> as our boy ryan which is great oh, of course he does a lot of sense uh and then senna has bridget which also makes sense but a weird pick for a character yeah um i'm also disappointed that the b-sides are just color variants i think it would have been cool to have some more Other costumes characters? yeah yeah i just yeah. like i'm like come on we got we got our boy ryan in here as a lands costume but why do we not have a land zeke costume as well what a yeah. fucking tragedy <laughs> yeah, no, right? what an absolute shamble we just have to settle for we just have to settle for him wearing a long coat and an if eye patch. in the expansion i'm fucking i'm clapping hands dude where the fuck is my zeke representation <laughs> in this video game i agree um it just seems weird to me because the colors are cool. Like you know, like I say, the 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 Mio one feels particularly good. I like that one. Uh, the color scheme. Uni's one adds color to it. The Jin one just looks like a different color Jin. Like I say, they don't really feel like they're worth going for, especially because they cost three k each, which is basically a whole yeah. run just to, like <laughs> a whole hour run just to get each one. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I think I got two of them, and I was like, that's enough for me. Um. In terms of the game itself, Kyle, how do you think it plays? Um, no pressure. It's you... very slow, mm -hmm. and I I'm agree. not a fan of that. It does take uh, a while. You summed up my feelings of the combat of the first two games. <laughs> <laughs> I think my problem is with it is there's no balance to it. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. I've like, I like it mm -hmm. quite a bit. I liked it enough to play it for five hours and then go, I'm never playing this ever again, but I had a good five <laughs> hours. I think the problem with it is the first two difficulties are far too easy. Where I the the beginner one I did not even struggle on. We just stormed through the whole castle and we're like, oh yeah. cool, that was easy. Thank <clears> you for <throat> my costumes. The second one I had a couple of cliches, but that was mainly because the timer, the, basically the whole mode has a timer. Got the hunter, on timer and if the knop on timer goes to of zero, of course it's the knop on get, fault. Yeah, you get fucked basically. Your yeah. cooldowns you go do to nothing. You go, your cooldowns go to a million. Your damage gets reduced and you can't heal. You just sit there going, you, you pray. You pick a god hunter and you go, please let me live through this and hope that there's a knop on timer at the end of this. In one. the name Those, of Hades. 
my, <laughs> my my successful run through the intermediate difficulty, I shit you not, I lost my nop on timer. I had to go through four fucking rounds with no nop on timer to get the nop on timer <laughs> to show up again. <laughs> Game oh, was being no. a dick for no reason. Um, Damn, bro, you try using Lucky 7? I hear I that breaks the video game. <laughs> no, I didn't use Lucky 7 at all because, once again... I was I, I refused to use Lucky Seven ever in this video game. I still haven't to this day, other than the one, the one fight where you use Lucky Seven <laughs> in the tutorial. I've never used it ever again, and I still intend to keep it that way. Dude, um, there's a there was a clip of Harry McIntyre, the voice of Noah, playing Xenoblade Three, and he got to the part where he got the Lucky Seven tutorial, and he was just losing his absolute mind, like he went mad with power. It was the <laughs> greatest. <laughs> that's pretty cool dude uh, harry's such a gem no i was playing as uni with the guns die, that was what die, i was doing die. that's uh, fair yes, that's a that's class. a nice I was playing as uni reaper dude like the more <laughs> i think about it the more the more i think about it the more i realize that the gun guy is basically um reaper from overwatch like that's him in a past life dude in the xenoblade that's the weeb version of him he's just <laughs> old man angry two guns bang bang like that's dude, him it... It even works with like the costume that they get because it's like a torn up cloak on the shoulders. Yeah, yeah it works. It, that's my canon. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was just fun. Uh, like mm. I say though, when it gets to the hard difficulty though, it's absurdly difficult. If you, I assume, if you use Lucky Seven, it probably becomes a lot easier. But if you're not using Lucky Seven, that final challenge, there's like you have to to get Noah's costume. You have to beat fifty rounds. Like you have to get to round fifty of it. There's 140 rounds. Whoever does that, get a life, dude. Because Jesus, that's way too long. It took me an hour to get to forty odd, and I'm like, it never ends. <laughs> like, please make it stop. <laughs> um, but it's really hard. Like it just it gets absurdly mm -hmm. difficult. Where it's just like your defenders just aren't doing their correct job. This, for some reason, everyone targets the supports instantly, and you're like, well, bye-bye. I guess it's rip for me. Um, game doesn't give you any healers. The game doesn't give you any healers. It doesn't give you the right ones. The amount of times mm. where I'd see a hero, and I'm like, I don't really want you, but do I <laughs> risk not? You can't drop heroes either. I think it'd be a really good mechanic yeah. to drop someone from your team to pick someone else up, but... Because the amount of times that I'd go through something and it'd show me the de the defenders and it would just give me like Zeon. I'm like, I don't want you. Like, what if, like, what's, like, <laughs> hear why? me out. Yeah. All DPS party. Oh my god, Hunter, no. <laughs> kill them before they kill you. It doesn't really work that well. It does. I tried, but it doesn't really work that well. But, like, you know, Zeon's shit and it keeps showing me <laughs> yeah. him. And I'm like, no, I don't want you. No, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. And it would just show you Monica, and it's like you just you're like you know you know just which Monica. you know which characters you kind of want. And I think that's the problem. Yeah. Is you kind of know what characters you want in this mm -hmm. mode, where it's like you see a load of characters that you don't want, and you're like, no, you know, I don't really think that any of these are gonna work. So you just like guess I'm not taking a hero, and then it could be five or six more rounds until you get another one. It's just really annoying, right? Stop you know, giving me Aphrodite boons. I wanted Artemis. It genuinely is where you'll get people like you'll see Valdi and you're like, "There's no way. There's no way in hell I would ever pick Valdi for anything. Why? No, don't like. Let me lock people out because it's like you know, you're looking for you're looking for your sharers. You're looking for like your big damage dealers, really, as well. Where you're like, or your god tier supports like Fiona or yeah, Fiona. You just instantly pick up, yeah. Miabi, that's her name. Miabi. So, it's yeah. been a while since I've played Xeno 3. I need to remember all the names. <laughs> but yeah, Shira, like, it's like Charlie top Ouroboros. tier. Ouroboros. Charlie it's a cool Ouroboros. idea. And this is the thing is, I'll give them props for trying it because I liked it quite a lot. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's a cool idea. Spin -off. It's just the balance of the game doesn't really work well with it as much as you'd like it to. Mm -hmm. It feels too much on chance, which don't get me wrong, chance is always a part of roguelites. That's what makes them fun is not having the same run twice, is having something go, oh, if only I had this, this would make it a lot easier, or if only it didn't go this way. But sometimes it feels like the game's just being a dick for no reason. It's as if it went, oh, Returnal's hard. Let's just be a bitch then. That's their response. It's like... <laughs> It's like, oh, people die in Returnal a lot, so let's just have it that if the nop on time is low, let's just fuck with them and not have the nop on timer show up now for six rounds, just for shits and giggles. Like, it's... When the nop on timer, Kyle will know, most of the time, the nop on timer shows up every other round. And I'm like... Yeah. 
Why does it show up every other round? It's as always there except it, when you need it. It's like, yeah, fuck it off, dude. Get it in the bin. Get it in the bin. It's, it's just, it's very weird. Uh, but mm. I do like it quite a bit. Uh, and I like it more than regular challenge mode just because it it goes, it gives you, like, obviously, you have one character and you can buff them and you can choose what class you want and which accessories that you want to take in. And that's good. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't have this kind of menu min-maxing that the base game has with these challenge modes where it's like, okay, I need to know what all six of my characters or all seven of my characters have, all their accessories, all their slots and stuff. It's like, you pick, focus on one and then go, okay, I like this, these heroes. Let me try and work on getting these heroes. And it's more of, it's more of a slower burn than it is kind of, here's how you beat, this is how you beat like uh, N and M in two seconds by uh, having all this bullshit and having the RNG work properly. It's just like, hey, survive as long as you can and then die on round 41 like a bitch because you're an idiot. With only yeah. tree branches. It's, and I'm sure people will do that, but it's, it's, it's a very interesting mode. I do kind of... Like I say, I respect that they did do something different and it just wasn't, hey, here's another half of those ma same kind of challenge maps that you got in the first half. Mm -hmm. um, I also hate... Really cool idea. I also hate how we didn't see this coming because the teaser image for the uh, this part of the DLC, if you had just looked at it like I had looked at it for a million times, you would have noticed that there was three heroes in it with a character. So I was like, if only I had noticed that there were multiple heroes, you probably would have realized that it wasn't just going to be other like same challenge maps, but we all just You didn't dogged. notice that? No, I didn't notice that. I would have 100% huh. been like, oh, they're doing something different. I was just like, oh, challenge mode. You know. But fair play. All right. Anyway, hmm. let's talk about DLC four. So we talked about the trailer last week. So if you want to go and catch up on our reactions to the trailer, that's cool. But I just thought, Hunter, you can join in on this one. I just want to know what you'd want to see from this expansion or this new game, essentially, that would make you hyped or interested in it. Because especially for you, Hunter, because you didn't play Torna. I did not. So I want to know what would make you interested in actually picking this up as a full game experience. And I just want to also know, like me and Kyle, we can talk all day about this shit, what we'd want to see and what we don't want to see. Yeah. So, because it's interesting. See, that's the hard thing is for as much as I liked Xenoblade 3 and mm -hmm. think it's the best one, I clearly wasn't itching to get back to it as far as playing these other DLCs. Oh yeah, but and... it's not worth it, that's why. That's yeah, why. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, well, I also was never itching to go play Torna either. I'm like, I'll just wait till the next one to play Xenoblade again. And then... So it's kind of like one of those things where I don't really know what it would be unless I would, until I would see it kind of mm. deals, where I'm not really sure what it would be that, you know, this expansion could sell me on that would make me get it because like shulk and rex don't do it <laughs> to be that, that, honest see, with you that's what's interesting <laughs> to me that's what's interesting to me because it makes for a hype moment don't get me wrong and like i said this a bit in the t when we were talking about it last week i do want like i'm like i'm very excited to see these characters again and i'm very excited to see the others again because you assume because yeah we've seen we've seen nia and we've seen melia in the main game but you're assuming that we're going to see pyro and mithra again you're assuming that we might see Maybe a couple more of Shulk's friends along the way. If there's no Ryan, I'm going to cry. Um, now it's crying time. Yeah, now it's crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also hate... It's the same reason that I don't like Fire Emblem Engage. Is I hate when things pander on nostalgia. And that's why I really did hope that if we do see something, it was a successor rather than a prequel. And now... <clears throat> With that teaser, it's like, yeah, it, it is more than likely going to be a prequel again. But we well, still don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Yeah. It could yeah, still be anything. To... They could be baiting us again, where it's like we showed you the statues because they are in the past. Maybe it could be both. Maybe you do. Maybe that's just a flashback. You don't know what it is. So we're just sitting. That's yeah. what I'm thinking, dude. So yeah, I don't. Yeah, no idea what it actually is. Um. So. I'd definitely be more interested if I knew for a fact that it was more about the people in the third game already instead of Yeah, and I mean, that's stuff. a great start. Here's my first hope, and my hope is, it says on the DLC card, new cast of characters. I hope that the old cast of characters still show up in some way, shape, or form. That's my first hope. Um, I'm assuming that 
Noah and Mio probably will in some way, shape, or form. But I just <laughs> feel like the reason that Torna means so much is because it's in that kind of period where it impacts the characters so much, where it's like mm-hmm. it has an actual effect on, you know, not only Mithra, but it also has a, an effect on Jin. It has an effect on Malos. It has an effect on you know, it has an effect on a shit, what's in it, Haze. It has an effect on a load of characters that are in Xenoblade 2, and when you go back and play Xenoblade 2, you're like, holy shit, I get a lot more from this now than what I did originally. Whereas the problem with the prequel stuff in Xenoblade 3 is, yeah, it's cool, and it's a fan's dream to see Rex and Noah hang out and, you know, for some reason, <laughs> not re- like Rex and Noah and Rex and Shul to all hang out, but... It's also, that's not going to add anything to Xenoblade 3. What so fucking mm-hmm. ever. It's just going to be, oh, this fight happened in the past and they won and that's it. So that's why I'm kind of like hoping that it's not just that. And I think with Alvis showing up, I don't think it can be just that because you're not telling me that there was a point in Xenoblade 3 where Alvis just showed the fuck up and they went, yeah, we beat you and now regular <laughs> Xeno 3 happens. That's not possible. I just don't see that being <laughs> the way. Dude, I think Alvis was the biggest curveball from that whole trailer because going back to xenoblade original on the wii Mm -hmm. and the concept of blades and aegises didn't exist it wasn't until definitive edition came in with the retcon changed his little key necklace to that to the aegis core crystal Mm -hmm. and so i wasn't thinking alvis was anything important at all he was just Mm -hmm. self-contained to xenoblade one but then seeing him come back here like what what what's he cooking dude what's he cooking and also what's he scheming again it's one of those things as well you know where i just don't understand again i don't understand how it would fit in to regular yeah. play three where alvis shows up they have to defeat him but zed's still around <laughs> and they don't like i'm like bitch please i i think there's more to this than meets the eye i do think there's a curveball because mm-hmm. That's like my biggest hope is I really do hope that it feels like an epic conclusion because I feel like this is the end. This is it. Like we will probably get another Xenoblade game. I'm sure we yeah, will. Yeah, Xenoblade X2, baby. <laughs> Good meme. <laughs> but I think we will get something, but it won't be in the same universe. We won't have these references anymore. It'll probably be a fresh start in a similar way to. Well, maybe there'll be hints and like little bits and pieces. Maybe you know you'll you'll have your kind of um, God. I'm a fake Xenoblade, uh, Xeno fan. Uh, Kyle, what's her name? Fucking the character that showed up in Xeno Two. You know, as a blade. What's her name? She's from Xeno. Alma. Yeah, you know Alma and what's the... Cosmos. Thank you. Oh, Cosmos. Yeah, you know, like there'll probably be little hints and bits and pieces like that. Like there'll yeah. be an auto around like as a secret weapon or whatever the fuck you know the, the usual. The, the super weapon in Xenoblade Four will be Lucky Seven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like bits and pieces like that, but. I feel like this is probably the culmination, right? I feel like yes. We ever since we saw the the teaser art of all three of the main weapons all on the field, it's like this feels like it's the culmination. Oh. But I feel I really do hope it feels like <laughs> that. I really do hope where it's like if this is the last we see of all of these characters, I want it to one be a good end point, but two for it to feel substantial and feel like it meant something. I don't want them to just rip, like whip the fucking short card out just because they love Adam Halden. Don't get me wrong, I love Adam Halden <laughs> as much as the next person, <laughs> but I want there to be a reason where I'm like, okay, I actually like Shulk more thanks to this than I did in the original. I don't want it to just be a Fire Emblem <laughs> engage of, hello, my name's Yuri Lowenfall and I play Marth. <laughs> like, I <don't laughs> I'm Marth that. Fire Emblem. Yeah. It's just, that's and that too much to ask. And also Is that too much to ask? I don't know. Um, yeah. And in terms of gameplay, do you think they're going to do a combat change again, Cal? Or do you think they're just going to... No. You don't? No, I think it's going to stay the same from Xeno 3. I've got a, I've got a controversial... Uh, it's not controversial, actually. I think, I think what they're going to do is one of two things. They're either going to limit the party to six and get rid of the hero slot, or they're just going to have a party of seven. I think they're just going to... I don't think they'll be heroes or anything like that. 
That would be mm. crazy to me if they were like, yeah, we're just going to lock a load of people behind the hero barrier. Like, oh, sorry, you <laughs> thought you were playing as Rex and Shulk? No, they'll be hanging out with you. Like, you watch them play the game. <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. Um, but I, I don't think... I like Tornus Combat a lot. Um, but I think they did that mainly because they realized that it didn't really work. That, like, in terms of, like, a short-term story, they were like... Oh, mm -hmm. if someone's new to this, they're gonna have to learn the whole fucking combat again. And like me and Hunter, we finished, we played the whole of Xenoblade Two, and we still didn't learn the combat by the end of it. We were just going, eh, whatever fucking works. I think uh, this is boring. Yeah, <laughs> nah, where's the pussy? Please, in? please, regular enemy, die faster. <laughs> is there an easy <laughs> mode? Good, thank you. Yeah. So I feel like they're just gonna stick with what it is. Um. But what I yeah. do hope that they do take from Torna is a n new map. That's what I hope. I don't want to retread. And by retreading, I specifically mean if you do the shit where it's like, hey, guys, guess what? It's the places we forgot to add to the original map. Like, I'm like, don't you fucking dare. Like, don't you dare. I just want some new interesting stuff. I don't, like, I want at least be mashups. Don't just go, oh, look, guys, it's it's time for the planes. We're back to Gal planes because you like it. Look, have you guys played Smash Bros before? Look at this thing. Wow. Wow. Look at those hills. Boy, howdy. So it was now a bad time to point out that they actually showed Gower planes yeah, in know. that trailer. That's why, that's oh, why I'm you saying, do I, Yeah, that's, okay. that's why I'm saying I really <laughs> hope that that's, again, just a cutscene, please. I don't want to play just Gower planes. Please and thank you. It's just... I mean, if they took, like, the what base game did and like mashed areas from one and two together a hundred percent but i have a scary feeling and it's feeling. not just our yeah. planes again i have a feeling though kyle and this is what i'm scared about is if this is a victory lap they go through and through of it where they're like no gower planes is gower planes victory lap and play the theme Ch timmy <laughs> get on the fucking music <laughs> You know, I just, I li like I say, I like nostalgia, but I feel like we live in a world and I blame, I 100% blame Spider-Man No Way Home from this, where everything now has to be a panda to, look, it's that old thing, you old fucks, like us, please. Personally, I blame Star Wars. You know, Star Wars. I also blame yeah, Star Wars. But here's the problem, Hunter. People episode 7 like, is just episode 4. People didn't like the Star Wars sequels. They liked episode 7, but by 8 and 9, they'd all fucked off again. They hated them, right? Whereas it's like. Well, that's because they quit pandering. Yeah, and for some reason. <laughs> no, they, kept, they were like, okay, episode 8, you bring back Luke. There you go. With episode 9, we. Uh, Somehow Palpatine returned. To bring back Palpatine, exactly. You know, stuff like that. They still pandered, they just did a shit job. But it's like Spider-Man. Everyone ate up <laughs> Spider-Man No Way Home, where I still believe that Spider-Man No Way Home is a terrible movie. Fight me on this one. Um, and it's just like, ever since, it's like, you know, every single time, like, <laughs> Multiverse of Madness, bring back fan favorite characters, you know? You're looking at, like, it's just like everything's just kind of nostalgia baiting you now, where it's like, oh, look, you want the old thing again. Remember the old times, guys? Look at how good the old... I'm like, fuck that off, dude. Fuck it off. Fire Emblem Engage, fuck off. Pikmin 4, they're probably all... All those characters that were in Pikmin 4 that we didn't even <laughs> know existed, they're probably all old characters, guys, and they're probably going, oh, my God, it's fucking Actually, Phil. I love Phil. I take back my Star Wars comment. I play Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's a good, that's a good point, to be honest. This is all Charizard's <laughs> fault. It is Charizard's <laughs> fault. Blame Gen 1 is, guys. Blame Gen 1 is. But I just, uh, that's like my biggest hope for Xeno 3 DLC is that it's good and not just a hello, Shulk Xenoblade. I am Rex Xenoblade 2. Nice to meet you. Shall we high five? And that'll be a cool <laughs> thumbnail pose for the YouTubers. There you go. Yeah. It's just, I, I, I just, I just hope it's good. Is that too much to ask? I'm scared. It's I'm gonna scared. be good. I'm scared. I genuinely am Dude, scared. I have. I have full faith in Takahashi's team. They, know, they've yeah. proven time and again that they can, they can do. My do only stuff other like request this. is that it's not as shit as Future Connected. Is that something that we can ask for? Can it be? Can it not be shit? <laughs> God, Future Connected was a thing. I got it, that one for free and still didn't play it. <laughs> Dude, you're missing you. nothing. Fun yeah, fact. Oh, as someone yeah. who played it, you're missing nothing. Unless you want to see the yeah. actual worst villain Xenoblade has ever offered. It was pretty bad. Uh, 
Good which I, again, with Alvis being with Alvis being in the DLC, we can hopefully not. We're not going to have to deal with a bad villain. Hopefully, that's unless they royally fuck it up. That's the hope. Oh. Uh, don't add any bullshit nop on either. You you can bring back Ricky if you want to because he's a Chad. Yeah, Tor will Ricky probably show stay. up, which will be cringe, Ugh. but you know. Um, obviously, you can keep our boy Riku. He's the fucking he's the homie now. He stays where Riku well, goes. He, I go if, if he we, exists back then. Oh, he yeah, Melia gay. I still think that Melia and Riku <laughs> thing is so weird that it's like that's gonna. That's Riku's gonna always up. existed. Obviously. I think uh, Riku is Alvis, guys. Think about it. People had that theory, and now <laughs> <laughs> I really hope there's an anime transformation of Riku into Alvis. I really oh hope. God. You know that shot we saw in the trailer of Alvis in the light? That's him after regenerating from a knock on into himself again. <laughs> Dude, wait, what if Riku just, like, took off the wig and then he turned into Alphys? I just the like to think... The bad guy the whole time. I, I just He takes off the wig and it's just Alphys' head and it's still in the tiny body. You're like, wait, how's this working? I just like, don't get wait, it. Wait, give it a second. I don't get the science on this. Like, oh. oh, that'd be so good. That'd be funny. Oh, oh man. I don't know. Kyle, have you got anything else that you want to see? You're, you're, you probably like. I want references to Xeno Gears. That's probably your thing. I want it to tie into Xeno. I mean, they've already Mill. shown that the 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 fucking new protagonist is just Faye again, again. Is it Noah? Uh, it, some variant of Noah. And in my heart of hearts, I know that Takahashi's out here being like, Square Enix won't give me the back the rights to my game. I'll just do it again. <laughs> I don't, see like them try and stop me all they're doing with my ip is making fucking figures out of them every five years <laughs> gotta is keep it, that ip up just, dude is it an anniversary time to make the 300 dollars action figure hell <laughs> yeah oh uh, we gotta love square enix um, i love square enix so i can't wait to i'm sure you like week. some of their games that they make <laughs> although yeah. if you boil it down the percentage it's, it's less much, than it? half. <laughs> yeah. How many do you ironically like, and how many do you actually like? That's the question. Because it's like I feel like Kingdom Hearts is 100 percent born on irony. It's like it's genuinely like. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, I know Kingdom, Kingdom Hearts was born on nostalgia. I well, I had no nostalgia for Kingdom Hearts, so I'm 100 percent in on our irony on that one. Like I'm just like. Oh. I'm like, you better bring back those terrible voice actors. I mean, as like a general experience, I was like, Kingdom Hearts is fine. Yeah, I mean, I don't really get into the story, which is where the irony would come in. Oh, I love did. the story. I love this. I love so, the yeah. story of Kingdom Hearts, dude. Like, genuinely. In Jack Kingdom Hearts Four, please be out next year. Please, please, <laughs> for the love of God, I will do anything for Kingdom Hearts Four next year. Like, genuinely. <laughs> Honestly, I would genuinely, and this I know this will anger Hunter. I would genuinely like be okay with them pushing seven part two out of the way for Kingdom Hearts because I'm like, yes, it's time for cringe. Yeah, I don't know I if they time. would feel like they need to do that if they're cool with you know, oh no, alleging that alleging that they're gonna come out with both of these Final Fantasy games this year. You know, most people that do that, I'd be like, eh, probably not going to happen. I wouldn't. I, I, I doubt. I doubt that that'll happen. But with Square Enix and the way they like to shit stuff out as soon as possible, I'm a hundred percent. I'm almost in my head. I'm like, it's ninety percent happening. That's ninety percent coming out in December because Square Enix just likes to chuck shit out, hit the fan, whatever, get the job done. Well, they just yeah, but they it. also have projects that they have to designate as good, or they can't do that with everything else they make. <laughs> I honestly think Square Enix is like, is it in a broken state? Yes, we're going to have to delay it. Is it not in a broken state? No, hit that shit out of the fan. Is that thing Babylon's Fall? Release it anyway. And there you go. That's that uh, <laughs> hierarchy. Uh, but I don't know. Cal, have I missed anything else for the Xenoblade DLC that you want to mention? Um, I do find... <laughs> this goes back to the trailer. I do find it funny that in that little panning shot of Gower Plains... Yep. They show that territorial Rotbard is there, the big monkey. Oh, hell yeah. It, monkey. It, just, it just amused me that you can see him in the panning shot. The territorial Rotbard, my favorite Xenoblade character. Dude, I love the monkey, dude. Like, genuinely. 
It's not a Xenoblade game without the monkey scaring the shit out of you within the first four <laughs> hours of the video game. Um, but now, here's the thing. I know it's going to be good. It'll be yeah. decent. Will it probably be my favorite thing that comes from Nintendo this year? Yes, probably. probably. But even though Although, I, wait, I'm, Breath of the Tears of the Kingdom. I'm still, I, I'm 50-50 on it, dude. Like, genuinely. I, I love Breath of the Wild, but it's also been five years, and I've never been, I've never wanted to go back and play Breath of the Wild. So it's, like, one of those things where I'm, like, I'm very excited, but I also have, like, my memories to compare it to far enough ago where I'm, like, I loved it. But did I love it as much as I love other things anymore? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Like I said, I'm looking forward to it. It's definitely my most anticipated game of the year. And I feel like for most people, it should be your most anticipated game or you're tripping. If you play, if, unless you haven't played Breath of the Wild. Hello, I'm tripping. Yeah, but did you play Breath of the Wild, Carl? Um, I played a little bit with my friend in college. That's the spirit. We didn't that's play the... much <laughs> that's because I got bored. No, that's fair. That's 100% a not a Kyle game. Um open world game instantly Kyle's like no thank you I'm out Dude, there's too much you know when you're I've faced heard. with like choice paralysis that's how I feel with open world I games I also feel like in 2017 I still liked open world games where now I'm like very against open world games <laughs> like I like I can put up with open world games like currently we'll get to it later I'm playing Yakuza and that's a very small open world where it's basically just a little small city I can deal with that because it's very small and it's like, mm -hmm. that's fine with me. I was already tired of open worlds by 2017. So I was, um, I was getting there, but I hadn't played the rebooted Assassin's Creed formula yet, because I got to Ar Origins a bit late. Because I think, was Origins, 20, was Origins 2016? Assassin's Creed Origins was the game where I realized that I didn't like open world games anymore. Uh, and that was 2017, yeah. So it was, so yeah, it was just before then. So I was still like, oh look, this brand new way of doing an open world game. How great is this? And then Origins went. I was like, eh, bye, I'm done. Bring me back when they make another Zelda. See, and it was are. funny because Metal Gear Solid Five was what made me aware of the issues with open world structure, and also it was the it, before Breath of the Wild, the one I thought was still the best somehow, because it encouraged <laughs> you to it, it encouraged creativity with the mechanics in the best way, as far as that was concerned, more than any other game mm -hmm. like it did at the time. But also, it made me realize, boy. They're, the, the way they design the levels for these is very, uh, you could mix this around anywhere. The, f yeah. the ground zeros, the thing that everyone got all upset that it was on its own for, was the best level in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But now, like I said, Xenoblade 3, it's going to be good. It'll definitely be in the top two of Nintendo's releases this year. Uh, sorry, Pikmin 4. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Uh, but please do score high because you're now on my fantasy team, so I expect results. Thank you, Pikmin. Very cool. I'm sure uh, it'll get you an 80. It seems like the. Fucking bad. It, it, it seems exactly like Pokemon Snap as far as <laughs> how it'll perform no, critically. How dare you? Pikmin 3 oh. Deluxe got an 85. Oh, I'm expecting what? an 85 at the fucking what? least, Nintendo. I am expecting an 88. I'm expecting Xenoblade fans to get bitter that the stupid Pikmin game got the same score. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You'll have to buy it just to, so we can do I literally Pikmin wanted overrated. to get like a 92 and all the reviews to just go little things push Apple. Very good. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Like genuinely, that's what oh, I want. Man. <laughs> I love these little guys. <laughs> Look at these lads. <laughs> when the Pikmin's pick and min, that's my favorite part, dude. I love it. Thank you. Ninety five. You can pet the dog thing. Ten out of ten. <laughs> you got a point, dude. I, like genuinely, I'm Pikmin's in a whole different ball block. Anyway, let's move on. We've talked enough. About Xenoblade Blade Hunter, you played Vampire Survivors. I sure did. Ah oh, man, this was, this game was one that I was holding out for all of last year, being like, we gotta bring it to at least the Switch eventually, right? And hasn't happened yet. But also, <laughs> I'm still on that month of Game Pass that I redeemed to play Hi-Fi Rush, and in an effort to maximize it, I was like, ah, Vampire Survivors. I've wanted to play you for a while. 
in an effort to maximize it, I took the game that literally cost like four dollars and went, that's the value for Game Pass right there. Let's get it in. <laughs> well, if I if I wanted to ever play any of Xbox's full priced games, maybe this wouldn't be what I choose, <laughs> but that is yet to be okay, an issue. Game Pass is so, uh, Game Pass is the greatest value in gaming, I've been told, where I don't use it ever. Uh and I have I mean, three years I, of it. Yeah. So anyway, it was, and you know what? I would have, it would have, it would have been worth the ticket alone. But that's I got the annoying it for free. thing is, I know exactly <laughs> if they ever release a physical copy of Hi-Fi Rush, I'll be buying it anyway. So it's like Game Pass did nothing for me. I probably would buy it anyway. If I somehow <laughs> have an Xbox, if when if and when they do that, I would probably. But. Now, Hunter, you need to start becoming one of those people that just buys the physical copy, even if you don't have the console. You're just like, I like this game, so it is that'd mine be, now. I, that, that'd be a level of silly I don't know. I haven't been faced with that yet, so I don't actually know. Dude, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I envy the people who have gone digital only. I genuinely envy them, because they've just like thrown away all their valuable possessions. And I'm like, you know what? I respect the fuck out of it, because the amount of times that I've bought another game again physically just because I want the stupid disc that doesn't even have the full game on it anyway because the day one patch fixed most of it. I'm just like, man, I envy you. I envy you knowing that your games will die when the server's doing 15 years and you're completely fine with that. I envy you like so much. I wish I was you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Vampire Survivors is just as satisfying as everyone made it out to be. Like, mm -hmm. it does all of the little... It bra basically they took one of the little video game enthusiast lizard brains and like analyzed it in a lab and figured out which dopamine hits work the best because <laughs> it's a very easy game. It doesn't even, or as far as what it's asking you to do, you don't even need to press buttons. All you need to do is move. Really? <laughs> it does the attacking for you, and somehow it's still satisfying. It's the crazy part. <laughs> like uh, so. Yeah, and basically the gameplay is, you know, move your character around to survive and, you know, hit the things in the way you need to. Mm -hmm. And then every time you level up, you can choose a new thing that you've, you get like a choice of three. So basically you're like building, you're building out your character as you go. And the cool thing is there are like multiple characters you can select from, things to unlock. Uh, the more you do different stuff, the more things will become available will be unlocked in your pool of like you know level up skills mm. i guess yeah, yeah. i didn't really read the terms for that <clears throat> and the other cool thing is that like your uh the separate characters actually have like different properties there's this one dude who uh he starts off the, the like trade-off is he starts off with the knives which are kind of which is kind of lame because it only goes like horizontally once and doesn't do that much damage for being a thing where you have to manage crowds. But the cool mm -hmm. thing is that dude's perk is that every one of his projectiles comes in twos. So he, so even starting off, you're throwing double knives. So you probably, if you are good enough at what you're trying to do, will not die straight away, even though you have one of the not as great weapons to start with. And then there's another guy who like, you know, lower HP, but is like, area of effect things are better and so on and so forth and pretty much it's hilarious because the one thing that you do in the game is move and the most satisfying thing you can do is create a build where you no longer need to move i managed to do that once it was fantastic garlic plus health upgrades equals it it makes a portal of death that siphons the enemy's health <laughs> and you can just stand still and kind of wiggle yourself to pick up the experience every now and then. <laughs> it's the, it the most gratifying thing in the world. <laughs> you see things fly towards you and other things die. And you go, oh, there's a treasure box dropping over here. Let's go pick it up. And then gold will just spurt from this box for like two minutes straight. <laughs> it's like, here's another upgrade for you. And I'll be like, thank you. This is amazing. <laughs> I love this game. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, I'd be, this This is easily, like, if I had this game for more than 
you know, like six more or for more than like another week, I would, this would easily be another game. that would be like, yeah, turn on some music and just <laughs> play it for an hour or two kind of thing. Just going back to it whenever you feel like <laughs> when I'm not like needing, when I'm like, I don't want to focus as hard as I would for something like R- roller drone or Tetris. So I just want to, I want to be able to just stand here, <laughs> turn your brain off for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Which I still do to some extent with those games, but this is like I could straight up turn off basic functions. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, so I, like I can see the way they create the. So well, I can see yeah. why this game did so well. It's like one of those things. It's crazy because you know, you know, as we get further along with games, are getting more expensive to make, and you know, you got to do crazy stuff to even make your money back, and all that all these complexities and then this game is super simple and people still really gravitate towards it i just like the i like the spectrum of this game being able to exist alongside things like god of war ragnarok and whatnot i mean also the fact that in the uk it's three pounds 99 on steam to buy and that's the full price and it's currently on sale for 20 percent off so it's only three pound nineteen pence. So it's roughly it's usually on sale. It's usually five dollars or something in the US, and it's on sale for like four dollars right now. So it's like oh, yeah. there's no wonder that this game has done so well for itself. Which again, yeah, to me, is like it's like crazy that it's on version. Game Pass because it's like fucking hell. It's the price of like a coffee. Just buy the fucking game, dude. Buy it. I mean, that's the thing. I wasn't holding out for it to. Like you just want I wasn't holding out for yeah, yeah, I just want a platform that I want to play it on. Like I'd settle for PlayStation or Switch. I'm not really overjoyed that I was like, oh yes, PC version of Game Pass for it because <laughs> I would have just bought it on Steam. But the best you know. quality, the best quality, <laughs> the Xbox app, yeah. everybody. You got to look. Oh, the Xbox app. What a great interface it has. I'm still the, waiting uh, for the day. I'm still waiting for the day that they, they figure out a way. To just give Steam some money so that they can just get it through Steam because Jesus, the the Xbox app is the worst. Has anyone thing. tried to bring up the Xbox app in their myriad of court cases? Because I feel like that's dirt against them in some capacity somehow. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying. It, it is. It is bad. It is a war crime. I, I do hate it. Um, <laughs> but now, I'm glad that you're enjoying it. Uh, it does oh, like so it seems like a, like every every time I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, that's a hunter game. Hunter will get to it eventually when it shows up on the. It's know, like yeah, it's, basi- it's basically just it's like survival world with like Castlevania skins on it. It's great. Yeah. Uh, and who knows? Hopefully, it will one day leave its little exclusivity cage. Uh, we shall see. We shall see. I'm sure um, it's bound to at some point. Yeah, it's gotta be right. Gotta be. Right. Uh, what's next on the list? Oh, I played Yakuza. You. Wow. Um, I've been playing Yakuza because I don't know why. I've been, in a, I've been in a rut where I didn't know what to play. And I was like, you know what? I'll play Yakuza 1 because apparently it's only 18 hours. And I liked Yakuza 0, I think. So this will be a good test to see if I liked Yakuza 0 because it was a Yakuza game or because it was in the 1980s, which is very cool um because this one's set in like 2005 the most boring year you could possibly set a video game in it's like i don't know why what it is about (laughs) the early 2000s let me just double check what year it's set in because there's something about the 2000s where i don't know if future generations will think about it like this but it's such like a like especially the early 2000s feels like such a nothing decade in terms of personality that i'm just like anything set in it i'm just like it, anything in 2005 could genuinely just be 2013 but just <clears throat> to change the mobile phones and the internet like that's literally it like you just yeah change yeah yeah it's it's weird it maybe i feel that way mostly because it still feels like you know 2006 was only a couple of years ago so it's like I feel like I've not stopped living it somehow because my perception of time is broken. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's the game set it in 2005, 2005 unless right. I, unless I think real hard about, you know, what things were like back then, because, you know, not don't exactly have vivid memories of being seven mm-hmm. or whatever age I was. Yeah, dude, we all had our GBAs playing Pokemon Emerald on the playground. I did not do that. Speak for yourself. Well, I was not allowed nerd. to take anything to school. Um, but no yeah so it takes place in 2005 and 
it's interesting because it's a remake and it's in the same engine as Yakuza 0. So we're still at the point in the Yakuza timeline where the games don't play terribly. So I'm still having a good time. Um, I don't know. There's something about Yakuza that's very fun and very stupid because it, like, it finally balances this line of whimsy and absolute fucking absurdity. And then in the next cutscene, you'll walk God. into a bar and everybody's been brutally stabbed and murdered. And you'll just be like, yep, this feels like it's in the same moment. Like, I genuinely do feel like I just played I fucking karaoke. I love games that can pull this off. Yeah. <laughs> like, Somnium Files is a great example of this, where one one minute you'll be playing rock, paper, scissors, and Date will be screaming in one way or another very comedically. And then the next scene, someone's going to be sawed in half. Yeah. <laughs> it is one of those things. And it's like... So in this game, the remake, the big kind of gimmick that they did for this uh, game was because it came out after Zero, and Majima, uh, Goro Majima, became an even bigger fan favorite character than he already was thanks to Zero, because Zero kind of gave him a backstory and kind of showed you what he was like before he was crazy. And Majima is my favorite part of Yakuza Zero. His whole story is fantastic, and he's the from my first couple of hours with this, it's still a fantastic game, but if you're going to only commit to ever playing one Yakuza game in your life, play Yakuza 0, because that is the one to play so far from my first impressions. Um, but the gimmick in this one is a system called Majima Everywhere, where basically the whole po- the plot of Yakuza 1 is, is Kiryu gets imprisoned for 10 years for a crime he didn't commit, and by the time he's come back out, he's rusty as fuck because he's been in prison all the time. So when you get out, the first thing that happens to you is Majima finds you and he beats your ass and he goes, ha ha, you're weak as shit. I'm going to keep hit. I'm just going to keep finding you until you get good kid. (laughs) He's basically, he's basically the person that bullies you on the enemy team of Overwatch where he's like, you're trash kid. Get in the fucking bin. Like he's an Xbox 360 kid through and through. And Hey, he's only a year off. It's 2005. Oh no, it is two Xbox 360 year. We know where he's got it from. Oh my God. Anyway. Um, (laughs) um but yeah so the system called majima everywhere is basically uh he'll just be roaming the streets he'll be doing random things and if he sees you he will chase you down and he'll want to beat you up and you have to yeah the way you described it earlier was like uh very much like the pursuit creatures in resident evil is what it very reminds much me so, of. but he'll do st- stupid shit so for example first off he'll just be on the streets so you'll just hear him scream Kiryu-chan at you as he chases you down the street <laughs> and you have to beat him. And then as you get used to him and you beat him up more, because he goes easy on you, so you're supposed to beat him because he's going easy on you until he's training you up. He's basically your montage little uh, jockey. He's like, yeah, go on, chap, you can do it. Yeah. So it starts off with stuff like that. And then they just get more and more and more eccentric to the part where they're stupid. So like the next time round... And also, his, he's got a lackey, like, because he's the head of a family in the Yakuza. So he's basically told his whole Yakuza, like, family, we're just going to fuck with Kiryu for the next month, so get on it. <laughs> so, like, his lackey just keeps messaging you saying, oh, Kiryu, it's so weird. There's this officer by Millennium Tower. We don't know what he's doing, but you should definitely go and check him out. And you should te- definitely have a weapon on you when you walk past this police officer. Who knows what'll happen? <laughs> and then obviously you walk past. It's a yeah. false mustache. Yeah, it's, a mus- it's Majima <laughs> in a police costume and he's looking for a weapon on you so he can beat you up for having a weapon because you're breaking the law. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine that there's a version of this where Kiryu is like ordering a pizza or something and Majima like intercepts the phone call, beats up the delivery guy, takes his clothes like he's the hitman well, from well, Hitman. Trust me, he does shit like that. You go to you go to a hostess <laughs> club and like you'll go to a hostess club and instead of getting the regular girl that you talk to, it'll be Majima in a dress. You have to date it. You have to do that. You have to do the mini game with him in the dress. Like you have to just chat him up and talk. Oh Oh my god. And then beat him up. Um <laughs> there's one that's really funny where he pays all of his lackeys to dress up as zombies and pretend there's a zombie outbreak going, and you have to beat up his his <laughs> he has to beat up his lackeys. And then he's like, like, yeah, we just spent like the whole budget of our family on this one fucking gag because it's really funny. And then he'll just do this, stuff like that. There was one where he this jumped guy out sounds of the like every, and gave me a This guy attack. sounds like every goofy idea I've ever had, but had not but not had the follow through to through to do. Yeah, <laughs> like all of these yeah. things. Like I would love to just glitter trap somebody's mailbox to just shoot it, shoot glitter at them when yeah, they're like he, picking he, up their mail. 
<laughs> he jumps out of mail, but he, he'll jump. He'll jump out of like he'll like have fake traffic cones, and he'll hide in car boots, and he'll just like jump out of them <laughs> and try and like try and get you that way. There was one where he jumped out of a manhole cover at one point. Um, like there's just so many stupid like little things where you're like this is so bizarre you'll be fighting some enemies on the street and then he'll just run in and beat like and just start beating up on you as well his excuse is just like yeah one more can't hurt so he just joins in for for fun that juliana blake part of Deathloop should have been more of more of this energy and less of the you're just harder to kill comes in randomly sometimes and the thing is, it's really funny, and I really like it, but it is also one of those things where there's only so many of these, and he'll just keep happening, and he's not really on a timer, he's just on a, if you go into a building and come out, he's back for up for grabs, anything, so if you just go quickly into the shop to buy something and come out, he's probably around again, and he's gonna try and beat you up, so you better try and avoid him if you don't want to fight him. Oh, um, yeah. So I can see why a lot of people are like, you, there's too much Majima. And I'm like, I can kind of see why. Because it, while it's still fresh and things are happening and I'll just, you know, rock up to a random place, I'll <laughs> I'll be walking along the street and then someone will invite me into a bar and then the bartender's Majima and he serves me two drinks and he costs me and it costs me 56 million yen. And then because I don't <laughs> have 56 million yen on me, he tries to beat me up on the outside. Like, you know, stuff like that. It's oh, like... Man. <laughs> and it's God. like i don't know how the original yakuza kind of felt because the actual story from what i've played so far is a lot darker than zero dark zero has some dark moments but there's like it very much is like it's extreme even more so serious like yakuza is very weird where it does have this extremely serious plot and i'm like okay the goofiness in kiwami comes from all this stupid majima shit that's everywhere i don't know how in the original this worked <laughs> because i don't know what there was to lighten the mood it's very know. weird i feel like it i could imagine maybe it was Curious. like maybe there was like specific rather than majima just popping up aggressively everywhere all the time maybe there were like specific instances where you could stumble into him i don't know i could have a look but like i, I say it's, yeah like it's, I, it's i'm a, just guessing here it's a, like i say it's a very it's an interesting game because i like it a lot it, i don't like it as much as zero but i feel like because a lot of the personality is lost from the 80s kind of setting because it's like you know you go to a club in this game and it's just a generic kind of you know pop club because like you know the, the clubs that you would see nowadays whereas if you went to the disco in the 80s it's all flashing lights and bright colored you know suits and dresses everywhere and you know it's just like it kind of does lose some of that charm but it's still extremely fun and it still kind of has that quirky charm to it where I'm like, I can see why people like this franchise and I probably will keep dipping my toes into it every now and again where I'm like, okay, I'll play the next one and the next one and maybe eventually I'll catch up. Um, Slowly but surely. Yeah. If only they would quit putting them out so quickly, <laughs> then you'd be able to catch up. <laughs> Seems like the Yakuza machine's always spinning. Yeah, it's like... Um... Which is very good for the fans of the series. By no means yeah. am I saying that they should just go dark and not make things. <laughs> Bad no, for the people that want to try and try and catch up with the series. And it's it ha like I say, it has this good quirk to it where it's like it's made it's made obviously it's made Yakuza Kiwami one and two, the remakes, have made it more accessible to get into the series because you now have the oldest entries in a modern style. But also it's allowed them to build off of what they did with the storytelling in Yakuza 0. So now Majima, instead of just being this crazy fucker, you now know his backstory. You know what he was like when he was the same person. And you can kind of, they can add stuff like that in where you do these Majima Everywhere things and you can see the bartender scene. He was a bartender in his previous life, so he's wearing the same costume that he was wearing in zero and he's like you know i used to actually do this and kiri you can't tell if he's fucking with him or not but you like know the, you know what actually happened and it's like i kind of really appreciate that they've been able to add little bits and pieces of storytelling where they originally weren't and it's why i really like the way they do it but then at the same time i can see if you're a diehard yakuza one fan you might not like him just fucking jumping out of everywhere like <laughs> not being able to escape him but hmm. what year did the kawami stuff come out like uh, 2017 out yakuza 0 was 16 right so i believe it was either 16 or 17 let me have a look right. yakuza kiwami came out uh 2016 
So Yakuza Zero was fifteen. Ah. That was in, in Japan Kiwami's though. Worldwide, it was uh, twenty seventeen. So. And Kawami is the remake of the first one. A one, yeah. They only remade okay. one and two. So there's zero, one and two, and then from three you have to play the old version. Hmm. So maybe that's when I'll dip is the three and then just skip yeah. a couple, skip a few, one, two, skip a few. Like a dragon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but no, they're really fun. And like I say, if you're going to play one, play zero first, probably, because I feel like you get a lot from zero. Um, but Yakuza's fun and I can see why people like it. It's definitely a beloved series for a reason. I'm not sitting there going, I don't understand this. Like I do quite a few series where I'm like, okay, why are there 6 million entries and why does everyone like them so much? I can see why they like them. They have a really... How do they keep making Dynasty Warriors games? They have, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Whereas this it has a charm to it. Where, yeah, the combat gets a bit repetitive and stuff like that, but the quirks and the storytelling, the serious storytelling is really good and then the funny stuff is very funny. Like, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's an overall solid game. I'd recommend it if you have the chance. Also, Kiwami's like half the length of Zero. So if you, if you don't want to play a 40-hour version and you just want a 20-hour one, then, you know, that's an option too. Anyway, uh, Hunter, do you want to give us a quick update on Immortality? Ah, yes. I finished this game in the middle of the week, in th this past week here, and it's, yeah. it's one of those games, one of these mystery games, uh, either they nail it, or it's got me feeling like some kind of, well, okay. And Immortality is definitely the latter here. And I don't know if that's a victim of the fact that it's not like a it's like a non-linear thing, and maybe I just wasn't fortunate enough to get the sequence in a way that made the thing hit correctly. But like, like it's it's not as good as something like Return of the Obra Din, which I had similar feelings about, like the way mm -hmm. they wrapped that up, where it was like as a logical puzzle in mystery. Return of the Obra Din was really really good but as a attachment to the story and everything wasn't super attached because everyone or most of everyone was already dead <laughs> so like i was like yes i figured out the way all of you died and well there's nothing else it's kind of a similar thing here where it's like the the kind of crucial bits that i discovered last week i don't know it, i discovered in front i don't know if this is me predicting things well like i do other times or if it's just i got the right mm. information really early and it made the rest of it be like well they're probably this and this is probably what's going on and then i just spent a lot of time scrubbing through other movies that you know i didn't really care about <laughs> you know because like the the actual movies that are inside of the as the that are like the framing device of the thing I wasn't super mm. attached to. I was just like trying to figure out the hidden stuff there. And so it's just a very perplexing game. I don't know. Because I. Everyone seemed to really, really like this one in a way that it did not hit me the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's oh. interesting because. I know what happens in this game because a lot of people were talking about it and I was like, you know, I don't like horror games. I don't like particularly creepy stuff, so I'm fine with spoilers. When that comes to spoilers, I'm like, you can tell me whatever the fuck you want. I'm happy with that. Um, when I heard the ending, I was like, I feel like we've done this before and not only have we done this before, I feel like there were other games that came out recently that kind of had a a very similar kind of ending and I was like, oh, we're doing this again. It was very weird. So, I don't know. I feel like I could probably talk about it with a bit more clarity if I just warn... If I just talk about the actual specifics for a second here. So Go ahead. If I you, guess if you people, don't want spoilers... If you don't want spoilers yeah. But you really want to hear about Paramore, go and skip to that timestamp. <laughs> if not, skip to the outro. Watch the outro. We need the retention. Thank you. Anyway, carry on. So essentially, the whole deal with immortality is inside of these three movies, there's like reversed footage of what are evidence of this immortal being and a second one that pops up less frequently. Mm -hmm. That pretty much they're like the two dualities of art versus law, essentially. 
Mm-hmm. That's not that's not like their name. They're like the one and the other. It's what they're called in the credits. <laughs> writing down in my Damn. stupid writing down in my stupid little document how to refer to these people was also extremely silly because I didn't know what to call them because no name was ever given. So essentially, they're these immortal beings and like the one that you constantly see she very much appreciates humanity and wants to like elevate them through telling them stories and you know bringing and helping them tell stories that would you know live on longer like they imply that they like set up the story of the bible as far as like the crucifixion of jesus and like the garden of eden and all of that they said that that was all like a production put on by those two in an effort to elevate humanity uh, uh, i don't know why she still had faith in us after that <laughs> after it didn't work but so i got i pretty much came across information that led me to believe ah yes she likes humans and believes in like their creative work here and he doesn't he thinks they're stupid yeah and i've i was pretty much sitting there like Story that the of whole... one. <laughs> i was pretty much sitting there thinking that for most of the time and then mm-hmm. eventually i got like she event the the other came back during the production of the second movie and it instigated a situation where she had to kill him but because they like wear the real people or they like possess the real people this also caused man engages character to kill another actor and it caused the production to get canceled or whatever right and then so later on when they're making the third movie because the reason man engages character disappeared was because before that all happened the the one the lady the immortal lady she like possessed the director of the second movie too because I guess they can project. They're not super great at defining what these two. <laughs> it literally, it's like you just go, bah, 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 as you bah, bah, bah. and then it's just like I say, it's a very weird thing. And like I say, like if we're talking about full on spoilers, isn't um, don't, isn't like the ending where it's like the the game was the being, and now the being's a part of you or whatever, and it was like the kind of. Yeah, yeah. If you've ever heard the Majora's Mask and cre- possessed. Yeah, if you've ever heard the Majora's Mask creepy pasta about Ben drowned, it's oh like that. God. It is it's like that story. <laughs> is where I went with that. And I'm like <laughs> games have done this before. The There's problem also an of Doctor is Who that... that did this and it was very terrible. It was a bad episode of Doctor Who as oh. well. So the problem with this with that ending, the way I got it was first of all I was already kind of thinking, oh, well, you know, if she wants to kind of live on through the art anyway, because that's kind of mm-hmm. the point of what her whole theming was going for. And it's like, eventually there's a scene where uh, after after she killed the other, the first, during that second mm-hmm. movie, one of the things they imply in one of the earlier scenes is that, like, burning them will kill them permanently. Yeah. And, or at least so they thought, because, so she killed him and had that guy cremated and -hmm. thought he was gone for good. And then eventually he popped back up during the production of the third movie. This all happened because this one girl that was like a, it was like the girlfriend of the second movie's director, um, got to see the old, the unreleased movie's footage for some reason. And it was like seeing the moment where the immortal guy perished let him possess her and i didn't get that information until after the credits were rolling and went back this sounds like and i feel this, like this, this this sounds very convoluted <laughs> like, it sounds yeah. like a lot. And it, yeah it's like super weird because like i got those couple of scenes afterwards and i'm like if you could have just maybe gated some of if you could have just set it up so that certain scenes only lead to certain places like most of it can be non-linear but i feel like getting the the other possessing the conduit at the end there Mm -hmm. i feel like i should have seen that and then i should have seen the part where the one got torched because that was also something she like started 
dying or occupying two people when she brought Man and Gage's character back and also, you know, using the director to direct the movie started like physically harming her because I guess that takes too much energy to be two people at once. Um, if I would have seen the part where she got burned to death and the scene where witnessing that possesses, wish, witnessing the you know demise of these things causes you to be possessed, then I would be like, oh, she's literally going to live on through the people that wa play this game rather than it being like a symbolic thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so she hits you with like the I'm a part of you line when the, you know, screen does the thing which shows your shows her face all slowly. I'm like, well, I thought that's kind of where you were going with that. But I also didn't hit as hard because I was just kind of like not I understood it, but I didn't know why I got to the area. I got to the general area of what I was supposed to, but without like the proper way to get there. I got to point C by going backwards from Z rather than from A and B. <laughs> and just like, yeah, and like definitely. So yeah, if it would just adjusted the game a little bit to where the crucial things led one into another, rather than you know you just scrub, you could literally get anything at any point by just clicking randomly. Then yeah. But, you know, so like as far as video game mystery stuff like this, not as good as Return of the Oprah Din, better than 12 minutes, which is a hilariously broad spectrum. <laughs> but I also, say, I also do want to say that I do really like the idea of scrubbing through tape and reversing it and hearing creepy shit and seeing stuff. I like, like, there's stuff. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. It was super cool when I discovered it at first game. there. Yeah. And then eventually it kind of just evolved into me clicking on people's faces and just playing as far back as I could in reverse to see the thing. It, like, yeah, it, it was a cool idea that if I'd probably be cooler with if the payoff paid off correctly for me. Mm. Yeah, definitely. No, fair enough. Uh, well, let's wrap this up <laughs> with talking about the greatest video game music, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we promised this last week because we promised that we had no content and then we ended up talking about the Nintendo Direct for, I believe, approximately way too long. So, uh, That's just like an hour 40. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to make this one an hour and 30 at least by talking about the Paramore <laughs> album. Hey. Uh, what's really funny is, um, for those of you who don't know on the podcast, I do a radio show in my free time. I haven't done the radio show in a couple of weeks because of personal stuff and stuff like that. So this is the first time I'm talking about music when I have a music thing that's a side project, which I think is quite funny. So uh, why not bring it up on the gaming podcast? Why not? Um, so for those of you who are not aware that maybe only just listen to the podcast, uh, both myself and Kyle are pretty big Paramore fans. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people that are around us are pretty big Paramore fans because I feel like we all kind of absorbed it via osmosis because uh, of the one the time that we grew up and also just people around us also like, oh, you like that thing? I guess that means if we all like that thing, we'll just listen to that thing more and then there you go. <laughs> um, and after hey, it worked. how many years? Six years nearly. It's finally happened. They released a new album uh, called This Is Why. And uh, Hunter listened to it just while well, finished listening to it just before the podcast started. Uh, I Kyle, I, I assume you've listened to it a couple of times. A few, yeah. I've also listened to it a couple of times. So I don't know. I don't. How do we talk about music? I don't know. How do you? What do you want to say? What, the what's your opinion, Kyle? The... What's your opinion? What's track your opinion? by track. What's your oh, opinion? Dear God. Oh God. What's your opinion, Kyle? What's I can't opinion? do this track by track. Um, my <laughs> opinion of it is mm -hmm. that I think it's a good album on its own, but I wouldn't go out of my way to listen to any of these songs individually. Like I would with some of their other albums, like Riot or Brand New Eyes or Fake Happy. Interesting. I like how you say Fake Happy, because it's like, I don't listen to Fake Happy, but that's just because... I'm a sh I, I always have an unpopular opinion. What, uh, Hunter? Hunter? What's your opinion? What's your opinion, Hunter? Of this? <laughs> yeah. So, to clarify, I'm one of these people that am not 
in with the cool kids here and I am a very casual Paramore listener Mm -hmm. where I only know like their hits like my favorite song is Brick by Boring Brick as far as they're concerned and I only know like the other ones like Crush 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 and so on and so forth there Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so I've never listened to a Paramore album front to back until a few hours ago at this point for the video Um, game podcast for the video game podcast the weirdest homework i get for this show <laughs> but uh as far as it, it was neat it, you know like i don't think i there, there was nothing on here that i think i like more than the stuff that i already listened to by them mm-hmm. but you know there's still some cool songs i liked um i liked figure eight running figure out of time good and the news those mm-hmm. were the three that and like oftentimes when i'm listening to albums at a time from bands that i actively follow sometimes it doesn't hit me how much i'm going to enjoy them right away like you know sometimes i'll gravitate towards some when i listen to it the first time and then you know months later when they just suddenly track seven of unleash the archers abyss will um be what i want to listen to for like a week and a half straight three months after it's released (laughs) Hmm. Cause yeah, my my I always have weird opinions on Paramore albums because, for example, controversial opinion. My favorite Paramore album is After Laughter. That is my favorite Paramore album, which is a controversial opinion. Apparently, right, that's what that one's called. Yes, it is. Called when I said Laughter. fake happy, I meant After Laughter. Yes. I couldn't remember what the album was called. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, my bad. So and also when you look at my like my favorite. Uh, songs from each album they're always non-conventional picks like you know like you say hunter if you if you go to brand new eyes uh and you go to like this most people i'd say 99 percent of people when they say what is your favorite song from uh brand new eyes they will 100 percent always say uh, the only exception because they're normies as fuck and it's got 350 million, 340 million listens on Spotify and that's the It's a really thing. good song. No, <laughs> get in the bin. Also, also in, I don't know if there was like this in the UK, but at least in the US, that song got a lot of radio play when it came yeah, cause, out. because it's Twilight. Because of Twilight. Probably, yeah. yeah. Um, But yeah, so like my favorite is Brick by Boy Pick, which is the other normie pick on that one, other than like Ignorance probably. Um, oh, I like ignorance too. Yeah. I didn't. Know. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like if you go if you go to every other album <laughs> that they've done, and you and you like ask me what my favorite song is. So, for example, Riot. I, most people will say Misery Business or That's What You Get or Crush 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 or all these really good songs. I love Riot, by the way. It's my second favorite. Power <laughs> Riot's album. just a damn good album. It's my second favorite Power album. My favorite, When It Rains, one of the least popular tracks on the album, but I absolutely adore that song. It's like my second favorite Power song of all time. You go to After Laughter, you look at all these songs like Hard Times, people love, uh, Fake Happy, people love. Uh, my favorite pool again one of the least played songs on the album but i absolutely love it because it has this weird instrumentation with the like the weird it just has a really weird sound to it and i absolutely adore it uh which i also love and this is why hunter you said with figure eight it's also it's track seven again and it has the weird sound to it and i love it it's just like when they have like quirky like little noise like little i like how my random unleash the archers pick was also track seven for no reason (laughs) dude track (laughs) seven is usually good track seven is always usually good i love track sevens uh Uh. but like yeah i do really like that song so it's like usually i like the normal song self-titled can go fuck yourself uh i'm kidding (laughs) um no (laughs) Preach it, Ethan. It's their worst self-titled album. Self-titled was a bad it's self- album. Self-titled is their worst album, and I can safely say with this is why that album four, self-titled, is still their worst album. I will happily. Dude, why still... is self? Why, why is self-titled like twice the length of all the other albums? I don't know. Why does it have half the listenable content that I would want to listen I to? No. Um. But and like... why is the opening song "Driving Fast in My Car"? Oh God, no! That's God a knows. fucking mistake, dude. But that's the thing is, this is why it, to me kind of feels like a halfway house between um, like... "Brand New this... Eyes" and "This Is Why" and and "After Laughter," where it's like it's not. They still have that pop influence from "After Laughter," but they have tried to go a bit more back to their punk 
kind of side to them, mm-hmm. uh, which I like for the most part. I remember hearing the fir- this is why I first and I was like, I don't know if I liked this, so I didn't listen to it like for three months, and I was like, I'll come back when. <laughs> more songs come out and then when i heard the news i was like okay i like the news the news to me feels very much like a riot song that's come out 50, like 15 years after riot and i'm like okay i like that and then say Sa is a very weird song but i do like it as well and i don't know why kyle oh, i hate it uh, i don't know why why does it give me persona 3 vibes when i say that what you know like it's got weird talking in it and i'm like please why? don't ruin persona 3 for me i am i don't need this right the now french, the french song in persona 3 kyle whenever you hear it you're gonna be like you know what when Haley williams is just talking and say come so that kind of sounds like the same like it's like the same weird thing where it's like why are people just talking in my music like what the fuck is this <laughs> but uh Dude, i think say come so is the most annoying song on this album <laughs> Possibly the most you, annoying also, song like, Paramore has released. Luckily for you, it's only like two and a half minutes. But boy, yeah. is that the longest two and a half minutes ever. <laughs> I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I've, uh, it's like it's definitely not in I my hate it. favorites, but I don't I probably hate it. wouldn't go out of my way to listen to it again. I just thought but... it was annoying. But you know, I think, here we go. Are you ready? I think... And this is unpopular opinion a time again. Once again, Ethan Braver's unpopular Paramore opinions. I think the the first half of this album, aka the first four tracks, uh, which are supposed to be like the big, they're the, like the four singles, they're the big hitters. They're also the songs, like I way prefer the second half of this album than I do the first half of this album. I don't know why, I just very much prefer the second half. And I think that's just because, like I say, I love Figure Eight. My favorite song on this album is Crave. I absolutely adore Crave. It genuinely feels like an early Paramore song. And I'm like, it just, I absolutely adore. And the lyrics are great. I don't know why the lyrics to me, I'm just like, the lyrics on this album are fantastic. But the lyrics on Crave in particular, I'm like, that is some good shit. Like, Haley Williams is a good writer, as it, but I'm like, damn. Crave's got yeah. such good writing to it where I'm like, damn, bro. I love that shit. Figure Eight also does. I love those two songs. Mm. They're probably uh, big man, little dainty. I also like because it just they they always do like the fifth track, like the middle track, like or twenty six or something. I did they like that do, one. Too. They always do like a <laughs> chill song, like I don't, quote unquote chill. And I always love those songs. They just always like yeah. I, th- I think like I said to you when I uh, on Twitter where I was like the news is very loud. I feel like that's why I don't like the first half of this album. It's it's very loud. I like it, but I won't like Hunter says I won't go out of my way to listen to a lot of it because I'm like. It's very loud. <laughs> I'm like, it's very riotish, if that makes sense, where it is a lot of like, we're going to hit the drums as hard as we fucking can and we're not going to do anything. Oh, you love to see it. <laughs> yeah. And they're good. Um, but I, I do prefer the quiet stuff on the album. I don't know if that's because I'm just so used to listening to After Laughter where a lot of it is quieter. So when we mm. get back to the big aggression, I'm like, hey, my favorite song on the big aggression albums is When It Rains, which is probably the <laughs> softest song and also the most depressing of the lot. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting here going, ah, the noise. But I do uh, like the news. The news is probably my favorite out of the first four. Yeah. Um, running so out of time, I also like, though. Oh, that one was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no. It's a good album. It's interesting, right? Where it's like... Like, I instantly really... I instantly... After Laughter came out at a time where I really needed an album like After Laughter, and I really appreciate that album for being different and just sounding, like, really different. Whereas this one, it's gone back to the same, and some of it I'm here for. Like, Crave, absolutely love. A Big Man, Little Dignity, absolutely love as well. Figure Eight, I love weird shit. So as soon as they heard, as soon as I heard, I was like, oh, track seven, big, big hopes here, big hopes. And as soon as I heard that weird fucking noise at the start of it, I'm like, yes, good shit, good shit, good shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, from now on, I'm 100% going to be like, track seven better be weird as fuck, or else it's not living up to hype now. In six years' time, we'll reconvene. What is, what is track seven on Paramore South Title? Part two. I do like part two, actually. Oh, is this a trend that I didn't notice? What's track mm-hmm. seven on? Feeling sorry? Eh, okay, it's ruined by brand new eyes. What's track seven on Riot? Miracle? Okay, okay, yeah. It's, it's only modern Paramore. It's only modern. 
Uh, well, it's nice that you guys liked this. Uh, since you know, sometimes it's real. It's a real bummer when you know a band, like two of my two of my favorite bands when I was in middle school were like Skillet and Three Days Grace, and I do not like their current output at all. <laughs> <laughs> Three Days Grace, that's kind of because the singer left and made another band, and then Skillet just doesn't have the sauce. Well, that's the thing but... is, with the first half of this album, I genuinely did think that this was like, oh no, this is the Paramore album I'm not going to like. Because when I heard This Is Why, and I didn't really care for it, I was like, oh god, if it's a whole album of this, I'm going to be royally fucked, and this is like, this is it. And then when I heard the news, which was their second one, I'm like, okay, this is, I like this more, but it's still in the exact same, like, I think my main problem with the first four songs in this album is, and this is what most artists do, right? They all sound very similar to each other, where they have the same instrumentation and the exact same kind of style. And most, most artists, they'll have a whole album where they just do that. And I'm just like, not used to Paramore albums where every, al like every song sounds the same probably the closest that we have to that is fucking self-titled which is bleh, get it out get it out get in bed <laughs> so i was like kind of like ah, i'm kind of feeling a bit sus on this but then as soon as i as soon as again as soon as we hit track five and i was like okay i think we're okay here i think the second half's in the clear and then i got to that part and i was like yeah okay i can i can dig with i can dig this for the most part we'll see though of course, got to hear them live as well. Oh yeah, yeah, they're great live. Haley Williams is like a very captivating performer. Like I said, j very casual Paramore fan. They were my favorite group to play at the When We Were Young festival last October. Yeah, well, I I have got tickets to see them in April, oh. so I will be going to watch the oh, nice. current tour. So I am very excited, but I am also very scared to see what the set list is it'll be interesting because it's like i don't know what a paramore set list like do they just do the new album and a couple of old ones i assume they do half and half um i have no clue because they were t when they were touring um when they were touring before because i had a quick look at their set list mm -hmm. uh the whole album wasn't out yet so they were doing some of the new ones but they weren't doing all the new ones so. I don't really have a frame of reference since I don't know when things came out, but like I knew, like I didn't know things more than I knew them for, for when I saw them. So that would be like not all of us, just the normie stuff that gravitates beyond their audience, <laughs> at least. Okay, don't give me hope because the only thing that I saw because I've seen for a while because I've seen um. So I was looking at their set list and it's like last year their set list included pool. And I was like, that's such a niche pick that I really want them to carry that one forward. And it seems like they are, <laughs> but what can I say? Oh, I, man. It's just, I just want it. I just want it. Is it too much to ask? Is it too much to ask? Say Kamsar is also in it though. So I don't know about that one guys. I don't know how about that one. Are we going to run away? Kyle's was like, Oh, ticket order canceled. <laughs> 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 the news is also in there if it makes you feel any better uh kyle that's also dude i would there. tolerate sakem saw live man yeah <laughs> well I, yeah if i um i'll i'll read it why not fuck it it's a podcast who cares uh the set list apparently the last set list that they did was this is why sakem saw that's what you get day decode pool hard time still into you rose colored boy brick by boring brick i caught myself uh, told you so the news ain't it fun and then the encore was caught in the middle running out of time and misery business if it's that Ooh. that's a really good fucking that's a good set list. list that's a really good set list uh yeah wouldn't complain nah what if it's just say if i show up and it's just an hour of say commissar then we're gonna have a fucking problem like that's it <laughs> <laughs> i may go see them like in an actual proper show for them when they come around here because it's been very light on the uh, concerts for these mm. for the couple of months into the year so far and a couple of things the first like four months of this year very light on the things i want to go to as far as concerts so by the time we hit june or whenever they're coming around my neck of the woods i might be willing to eat the more expensive that i'm used to ticket cost dude you don't understand <laughs> it was a fucking nightmare getting tickets here 
They yeah. sold out almost instantly. I did get tickets, but they were so expensive. Holy shit! I've Isn't never li- so. I've never been to a live show before, so this was my first experience. And when I was like, "Wow, this is how much live tickets cost." No wonder people complain about how expensive this shit is when it comes to like big <laughs> shows. Because like, holy damn! It was yeah, like, yeah. It's like eight. And it was then, like seventy, eighty dollars for a ticket. I'm like, what? And then you got hit with the fees afterwards, right? Gotta love Ticketmaster, dude. Gotta love Ticketmaster. God, the well, Monopoly is, like the is how, the, yeah. The, the fee thing is like the most insulting part. It's super annoying. <laughs> Get fucked, fee. Just, Hooray. Just, just <laughs> mid- middle fingers to you because you can. Why can't you just tell me what it would be at the beginning? Like, I'm clearly, the, some of these I'm willing to part with anyway. And you're just annoying me. <sighs> oh, well. It'll be, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. We'll see. I don't know. I've never. I like I say. I'm not. I'm not used. I'm not big. I'm not a big per, like music person really. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. We'll see. Anyway, that's the end of our gaming podcast. Thanks for everyone for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Come back for April Fools when we talk about our favorite albums in three by three format. No. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> What day is April Fools this year? No, that's such a well, bad idea. Well, we'd have idea. to pre-record it, and I keep—I've pitched this idea like two years April in a Fools row. It's Saturday now, but yeah. Well, the problem is, is I don't want to put a main app ep- literally because the thing is, is, the way that when we started HGO, is it would literally be episode three of a new season is literally going Lamau, and I'm just like, ah, I'm scared. Well, by this point, the audience should be used to our shenanigans. No, fair enough. It'd right. also be really funny if the music one got like <laughs> beyond the usual audience, and then they came back oh, the next could, week dude. and were it like, could. "What is this? Why are they <laughs> talking about? Why are they talking about Metroid?" Yeah. When they come back next week and we review the Super Mario movie, hell yeah! Now that will count as video games. We will be covering the Mario movie. Uh, links are on screen tonight. Oh, by the way, uh, go follow us. Uh, keep up to date with what we do outside the podcast. You know, you know, the, you know the deal. Um, and yeah. Uh, if you just want to keep up to date with the podcast, you can go and follow us on Twitter at Hot Gamers Only. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, please, at youtube.com forward slash Hot Gamers Only. And hey, if you don't want to look at our stupid faces, that's cool. Head to your favorite podcast service, search for Hot Gamers Only, and you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. We're on it. Go and check us out there. Leave a five star review, hit the follow button, hit the dab, do whatever you want. I'm good. It's like half three. <laughs> I'm tired. It's over. Ethan's energy is gone. Uh, next week, we have. Octopath. Octopath, Octopath Traveler Octopath 2. Um, also, reviews are already out. Arts, probably, because... I could probably check that out, because it's on Game Pass. I don't know if I It will, is on Game I Pass, could. and my ex- my subscription doesn't expire until, like, Sunday. It comes out on Tuesday. Thanks, I Phil. some of it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Spencer. <laughs> Very cool. So we, we'll, we've got we've got games coming out next week, so we'll, we'll check them out. We'll uh, talk all about it then. But uh, until then, have an awesome week. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. See ya. Toodaloo.